we've been talking about the the covenants and we've gotten into the new covenant and we've talked about the sacrifices last and and I want to speak now about the confirmation of the new covenant with uh, oaths and if we turn again to Hebrews there's a lot in in covenant there uh, Hebrews chapter 6 Hebrews 6 Miss Davis would you read verse 17 please In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath. Interposed with an oath. This is God even, even doing this. Read 728. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. Okay. He's again just simply talking about that uh, the, the son is, is part of this oath. Now I want to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Everybody turn to Matthew 5. And read where it starts, Miss Davis. Uh, do not think I came to uh, abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, right, till heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law. Until all is accomplished. Until all is accomplished. Okay. Uh, not Jesus. Jesus is doing something that he is allowed to do. Man, as we know, would swear by the gold of the temple or if they really swore or the, or the temple or by Jerusalem or whatever, these different things. That's why you see the, those things actually mentioned here. But Yeshua does something worse than a, a city. He swears by an entire planet. He swears by um, heaven and earth. He swears by the entire universe. He says, until heaven and earth have passed away. Did you hear that? But he can do that. Why? Because he's the creator. All things were created through him and for him. He is the one in which, which holds them all together. And so he swears by this until heaven and earth pass away. Now what's interesting, there's a lot of things about this. Um, and first is, is jurisdictional, but the, there's another thing about these signs is these are the same signs and promises that were given to Noah and to Abraham. Abraham, step outside. Look up. Now, if you can count the stars, that's what your descendants are going to look like. Well, uh, okay, and he couldn't do that. Do you, do you understand? I mean, God is making sure that all of these things are connected, interconnected here, even in the confirmation with oaths. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. And again, we know that there is uh, the confirmation with oaths and there are uh, the laws, the stipulations of the covenant, but with the stipulations, there would be also the curses. And those curses would be, be spoken out. And Miss Davis, if you'll read, um, let's start in 10 and read through 13. For as many, uh, three, Galatians three, three. Yeah, you're doing good. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. Okay, do you get it right there? You hear it? If you're doing the works of the law and you're saying that I'm going to get my righteousness through the works of the law, you're under a curse. Why? Because your righteousness is filthy rags. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. Go ahead. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
that is it's fascinating. Now, what does Paul, now he is appealing, again, I'm, we're going to go through this a little bit, but Paul here is, is, first he says that here's the curse, and then he says Christ was made a curse for us. So again, we had the curse on us, what did he get? He got the curse. What did we get? The blessing. Fascinating stuff. In order, we were cursed in order that what? The blessing of what? Abraham. Oh, oh no. He went past the Davidic covenant. He went past the Sinaitic covenant. He went back to the Abrahamic covenant. He, I mean, wait a second. These were all done away with. This, don't pay no attention to the covenants behind the, the curtain. Uh, no. They, these covenants, we, we talk about them so blithely. Is that a good word? Um, yeah, oh, well, you know, yeah, and, there's, and it's a cute little fairy tale. This stuff is powerfully real. Uh, and the Abrahamic covenant, he says, we were blessed with what? Read that again. Blessed with what? In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now it got a little worse right there. We are going to get the promise given to Abraham, the blessing given to Abraham. Um, <clears throat> I just forgot, read the last line to me. Receive the promise of the Spirit through of faith. Of the Spirit. Now we are getting the promise of the Spirit through who? Abraham, comma, who? The believer. The believer. Abraham, the believer. Uh, anyway, fascinating stuff. Um, now let's go to, we, well, we know the, the bloodletting with the incision. Uh, Jesus, let's look in John 6. John 6. Would you read 53 through 56, Ms. Davis? Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. You want me to read? No, no. Okay. Uh, I, look, you cannot, you cannot, because we're, we're Gentiles, you can't get what an incredible shock to everybody that this Jewish rabbi, Samuel, it, 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 come on, for most folks, that's who he is. He's another rabbi. Look at the group he's got running around with him, and you have to be upwind from him because the smell is just awful. That's his disciples. Oh, brother. And he looked at them and said, Eat my flesh. <laughs> oh, let's push it beyond that. Drink my blood. There were LOLs that would have just passed out at that one. Little old ladies. Um, it just, I mean, this is too much. Too much. Cannibalism, drinking the blood. Um, Everything that's, that's non-kosher is what he's just bringing out. Everything that is vulgar, heathenic, uh, heathenish uh, practice and sin is there. And he just told them. Now, again, I, I brought up a, a few, or at least once during this teaching, that with every covenant, with I think the exception of one, and I bet it's probably there, there is a dietary law change. Every time. I mean, there's this, okay, covenant of creation, these are the plants you eat. Covenant of, uh, of the Adamic covenant, here's the plants that you can now eat, and by, by the way, a bunch of them now have thorns and thistles. 
um, we can assume, I think, safely that when Adam and Eve were moved out of the garden, he brought them to Texas uh, because there, there were thistles, thorns that they were going to get poked by. Um, anyway, uh, we, we see the conditions in these covenants and the curses and, and n notice that he is, is looking back uh, to, again, with the Abrahamic covenant, which was before the Mosaic. And so he appeals to these different ones, uh, but, but each one of them with these, these dietary law changes. And I think he was kind of setting, if, if the, the Jews have been paying careful attention, I think he was kind of setting them up for something. Guess what? There's going to be a dietary change. Remember the Noahic covenant, then we could eat meat. Um, and uh, anyway, we, we see that. Let's turn now to um, Matthew, or John, John 19. May I say something on that real quick? Please. Um, the, the things Jesus said were not going to be able to be received without the Spirit. God hasn't changed his way of communicating <coughs> to man. It's back to where we say, he, seek, ask, seek, and knock. Nicodemus was seeking. <laughs> he knew that, wow, he's saying things, but, and he's doing things, and God must be with him, but he came to him seeking to know. And God has always made it that way, that we won't know unless we put out the effort, like Dr. D was saying. It's those that seek find. Those that search for him with their whole heart find him. It's the God's way of doing things. And the natural man cannot receive the things of God. It says in um, 1 Corinthians that uh, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness to him. That was the, you know, the next verses after the verses where Jesus says, Eat of me, drink of me. It says, These things he said in the synagogue, and many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, say, This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? And it just, because if we come to God in, on our terms, God, you've got to explain it to me the way I can, you know, not, not so much that, but God, I'm coming and demanding of him to bow before my ways of thinking. He goes, forget it. We come on his terms. We come humbly before him. It's spiritually received. I, he tells me, you cry out for understanding. God already understands. I have to go to him. God, open my eyes. Open my understanding. And he said difficult things. And he said those will hear, but they'll not, un not be able to understand. They'll see, but they won't perceive. Because we come on his terms. And I just, those, you know, it were, again, the natural man. We want people to go, oh, yeah, I understand what you're saying when we tell things, but it's spiritually revealed. God has to open the eyes and the ears and all of that. And I just, again, they said, oh, that's too difficult for us. So a lot of them left. And God wants us to keep coming, keep asking, keep seeking back from, you know, where we started at the beginning. Yes. Yeah. Which is abiding in, living mm -hmm. in. Mm-hmm. Uh, We'll go, we'll go to our jobs. What are we doing? We're seeking mammon. We're seeking the, the money. We're seeking the things that are upon this earth. We're doing literally what he said not to do. Now, I'm not telling you you can't work because the Scripture says that. Again, one of those things, I, 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 people, we'll get around to it, but, um, well, I'm going to say it so I can say it twice. You'll, you will hear people say, we're no longer under the curse. 
And I, what, which curse? I mean, I, I know that it's, it's in Scripture, but which curse? What curse? All of them? Um, but if we were to look at uh, the curses, well, we're not under the curse of, okay, we violated, we're violating God's law, the, the law of sin and death, we're not under, under that curse. But the curse of having to work by the sweat of our brow uh, or to uh, that there's no no pain in childbirth we, we wind up going all the way back to the very first curse um, I want us to uh, and and with that let's let's good at go to uh, John 19 Ms Davis if you would read John 19 the whole chapter uh, just uh, two through three. Settle down now. We'll be all right. Two and three. Okay. And they, they began to come to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and to give him blows in the face. And Pilate came out again and said to him, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Okay. Um, read verse 34 for us. And one of the soldiers pierced this, his side with a spear, and immediately there came out blood and water. Very good. Thank you. The reason I'm bringing this up is because, again, a covenant requires bloodletting, and uh, with with making and making sure there's an incision there. Now, I want everybody to turn to uh, John chapter 20, please. And uh, <clears throat> I'll read here. Verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, put my finger into the place of the nails, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger. See my hands. Reach here your hand and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God, Woe! We, I, I, I know we, well, do, do we actually have, what is Jesus doing? He is taking uh, the, the wounds there, and that is the incision with the bloodletting. We see that, and, and he, is, he is speaking out something. Believe because of these wounds. This is blood covered. Okay? Um, now let's, uh, I want to go to, We're going to go and talk about the name exchange. And again, we've, we've mentioned this before, but remember, we take up his name Christian, Christ, little Christ. And that's only one way that we take the name. And, and I, I, there's I, others that I think are a lot more important than that one. That one has almost become worthless to say. Uh, but I want us to turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Ms. Davis, if you would... Verse 11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now, this is, this is wild stuff. We don't, I know we don't get it because you grow up with it and it becomes a big deal, you know, but it's a big deal. He's not ashamed to call them brethren. You are brother or sister to the Son of God. This, this is nothing short of amazing. 
Now, uh, but I want to go on a little bit further. Revelation chapter 2. Ms. Davis, will you read 17, please? He who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows, but he who receives it. A new name. Turn to Revelation 14. Ms. Davis, will you read verse 1 for us, please? And I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him one hundred and forty-four thousands, thousand, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Okay. Uh, and, and again, here we see blood covenant is, is in its depth. Now, but the thing I want to bring up is that he has taken our name uh, to himself. He's not ashamed to call us brother. And <clears throat> we have taken his name. But uh, when we're told to do this in his name, and again, this is just in way of, of understanding these things, it's within that name. And uh, in the <clears throat> Hebrews, not Hebrews, um, Matthew chapter 28, he gives us the Great Commission. And he says, baptizing them into, again, it's covenant talk, and the word is, in the Greek, is into. Uh, it's in. From the out, I think it's right. Uh, from the outside, into. In fact, I know it's right. Outside, into. You take the, into the name. They were outside. But now it's into, into, into the name of, into Father's name, into the Son's name, into the Holy Spirit's name. And it's, it's, it's a changing of our identity. I, I, I can't say it loud enough. This is, this is what Scripture is talking about. We're told to ask and act in Jesus' name. Um, and... We don't get that in the, the Mosaic Covenant, God said, okay, here's my name, Yahweh. Okay, I want you to use it to swear by. Well, now, you know, oh, no, we won't even swear by his, his title. Uh, or if we're due, we're damning somebody. I mean, great use of the name. But anyway, when we're told to act, to speak, in the name of Jesus, it is not something that is that we're just supposed to speak. It is positional. It's identity. We are in that name. And to be required every time you pray to stop in the name of Jesus, that's not what he was saying. Uh, it really, literally has become a, uh, a vain use of the name. Do not pick up the name of God and use it in a vain way. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God vainly. Okay? And yet we do. You shall not take it in vain. And we do. We take it up in a, a silly, silly way. Um, and I, the, the word... I, I, I looked it up. I can't believe I did this, but I did. The name Jesus is used in Scripture 932 times. Just, in, just So we're just talking in the New Testament. Um, Yahweh is used in the Bible. This is, this is staggering. 6,825 times. And yet when you pick up your Bible and read it, you will never see Yahweh in there. Why? Because by, we've gone, oh, well, we don't want to do that. God has given you a new name. And he has asked you and told you, you don't need to swear an oath. You don't need to say, in the name of Jesus, I'm saying this. Why? Because it's yes, yes, and no, no. That's what he says. Why? 
Would it be yes, yes, and no, no? Somebody tell me. Why? Because I'm in the name. I'm in the name. Now, I've said it before because it's, all, it's, it's, it's been often very funny uh, at men's conference or prayer conference, something like that. Until we taught blood covenant, I, I would not be using in the name of Jesus when I prayed. There were people that were incensed until they heard this part of the teaching and, and they would come up afterwards laughing and then they would say, I was ready just to tear your head off because this guy obviously is not a Christian. Why? He prayed and didn't say in the name of. Now this is pitiful. This is absolutely pitiful and it is. Um, anyway, uh, we are in covenant with him. We have been given his position. Uh, we, it, is not, it is not even my faith it is the faith of Yeshua. Every bit of it, folks, we've been, we've been brought into uh, the Lord, brought into the Lord, and brought into the names. Again, he says, baptizing in the water. Then again, it's not what it says. It says immersing them. It never says baptize them in water in this name. I'm not... Opposed to it by any means. Everybody stay calm. Uh, I'm all for it, but I'm taking it to a deeper level. That, that it's not just, okay, here's this ritual that we do. Why do you do the ritual? I don't know, but we do it. No, you are, you are immersing that person into the name. That's how you make a disciple. The only way you can do that is getting them in the word and, and teaching them to stay there. Um, we are to totally immerse them within Scripture. Uh, and within the word, within the name of God. Uh, for, turn to 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Please, 6, 19. Ms. Davis, would you read that for us? Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Okay, you are not your own. You know, that says two things. It says that this, the Spirit is in you, and it says that you're not your own. What's that saying? The Spirit is in you. But it's also saying, but you're not who you used to be. Why? You're in Christ. Okay? And if we look at it, my name is His, my identification is His, I live within Him, He lives within me, I'm clothed with Him, he is clothed with me. His life, the Holy Spirit, has become in me, and my life is hid within him. By covenant, by covenant, we have become what Jesus said. That, that got him killed eventually, and that got, they tried to kill him earlier because of one thing. My father and I are one. It's time to do the killing. And yet, that has now been given to us. You and Father have become one, being in covenant with, the, with Yeshua. And uh, we'll come in for a landing there right for, for today. Ms. Davis, do you have something you want to add yeah, in Yeah, just there, on the name thing, this is cool. I was reading about this, but... I, um, in thinking on the scriptures that talk about it in relationship with covenant, that we receive his name, but just like with Abraham, his name was changed. Peter, Jesus said, your name's going to be this now. It all working with relationship, the, Roman, uh, the Revelation verse that we read that says you'll have, receive a name that no one knows, but he who receives it and give you some of the hidden manna and a white stone, and on that name will be a name. No one knows, but he who receives it. But Jesus, in the chapter where it talks about him coming on the white horse, and it says of him, and this is really neat too, it says, his eyes are flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems, and he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself. It's a relationship with God. And the name changed me, all like with Jacob, you will become Israel. That covenant, but it speaks of a relationship. And just like uh, 
I read recently because I've thought of that before, but I didn't I had never seen about Jesus having a name that no one knew except he knows it. And the Ludies bring out how we give nicknames to people. We give nicknames to those that are dear to us and that how that's, you know, in different ones in, in David's mighty men, they had different ones had names that were significant to their relationship with David, almost like a nickname. And they're called, they were called because of the dearness of that relationship. They had that close relationship, and so they had this special name that was given them by that person that they were in this relationship with, and that's God speaking that to us. He'll give us a new name that no one knows, but he who receives it. And um, just like when Jesus, it wasn't calling her a different name, but when Jesus called Mary outside the tomb, she immediately recognized him calling her name. And God, it's about relationship. It's not some stagnant thing. It's a living relationship with God that he's called us to. And just that's so neat that he... The Lord in that covenant has a name. I love how John would refer to himself, the disciple whom Jesus loves. It sounds so arrogant, but it wasn't. How did John know that? Because John was the one that hung on the words of Jesus. John was the one that wrote about keeping his word and loving him, and that's how you love him. John was the one that was given the revelation of Jesus Christ, the one disciple that didn't die, that we know of, a martyr's death. And he was the one that knew what God was after in relationship, what the Lord Jesus Christ was after in relationships. Us love him and be intimate so he could say, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. And it's about relationship. All The whole thing of covenant is about being like Abraham, the friend of God, being in that intimate relationship with God. And so the name and the name exchange and the name that he has for us that no one knows but he who receives it, that all speaks of that intimacy. Even Jesus with the Father, he had a name that no one knows. Mm -hmm. So anyway, mm -hmm. just those things. Very good. I'm, I'm, again, I, I'm always, I laugh. I don't know how many times I've taught blood covenant. Um, <clears throat> And every time I do, I find something else. It just, it just stuns me. Amen. Thank you.